追いつけない追いつきたいのに突然物語君にさわからないよあんさ Valentine's Day may be over, but love is in the air all year round on Manga Mavericks, but most especially today, because today we're going to talk about a story. My love story. No, not my love story, as in me and my love story, but the series called My Love Story, or in Japanese, Ore Monogatari. Written by Kazune Kawahara, creator of High School Debut and Hours of a y a l with art by Aruko, artist of Akizaka and First Love, among other series. We are talking about my love story today, and finally, folks, we're talking about this series after two years since episode 17, aptly titled We Need to Read More Shoujo Manga, in which we promised we would read my love story. Finally, 60 episodes later, we are talking about my love story. The first shoujo manga we're talking about on Manga Mavics. And who better to invite on for this auspicious occasion than the host of the shoujo manga podcast, Shoujo and Tell, Ashley McDonald! Hello. I, I, don't, I can't follow up that great intro. <laughs> it's, like... okay, it's okay. Most people can't. <laughs> I would say also on my podcast, I have in the description that we cover contemporary things like my love story, and I have also not done it, and it's been over a year. So we're in the same, we're kind of in the same boat here. Finally, together we can cross it off both our podcast's bucket list. I know, we're finally doing it. Yay. I was, I was going to say, good. I, I, so I, I don't feel as bad now. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> exactly. But yes, My Love Story is a series that's been a long time coming for us to discuss on both of our shows, I think, because it's a series I think all three of us really adore. I adore it now. I hadn't actually read it before, I'd only watched the anime. <laughs>、mm. Whoa, really? Whoa, I know. Mind blown. I think we'll go into our histories with My Love Story in a little bit. But first, a little more background on the series. As mentioned before, it is written by Kasune Kawahara and with art by Aruko. It was published in Bazatsu Margaret from October 2011 to July 2016. Though it debuted as a 100 page special in a Bazatsu Margaret Sister first before moving into regular Bazatsu Margaret. The Viz release of the manga ran from about July 2014 to September 2017. And as mentioned before, the series did inspire a 24 episode anime that came out in April of 2015 and ended in September of 2015, which covered about the first nine and a half volumes of the series. There was also a live action film that same year that came out on October 31st, 2015. Which, from my understanding, is most, it takes inspiration from the manga, but doesn't necessarily adapt any particular art like completely straight and it comes up with its own original ending. I have not watched a live action movie, but I have heard it's quite good.、Hmm. I wouldn't mind watching it sometime. And the premise of the series is about this student called、uh, Takio Goda, who is this big, tall, muscular guy who, because he is so big and tall and, and muscular, that like people mistake him for an adult always, but he's also not. Because he's not conventionally like a pretty boy, he's not particularly popular with the ladies. In fact, oftentimes girls are bad mounting him behind his back. Girls that he's been in love with and interested in turn out to have a very low opinion of him. But luckily, he has a great best friend who is the object of admiration and affection for many ladies called Tsunekawa. Who sticks up for him and lets him know what people are really thinking about him and is basically his best friend in the whole wide world who's looking out for him.、And、one day, Takio notices a young girl being groped on train and he intercedes and stops him and 
afterwards that girl falls in love with him. And at first, Takio doesn't realize that she's fallen in love with him. And he thinks that she's in love with his best friend, Sunakawa, like all the girls he's interested in have been. But over a series of misunderstandings, finally, the truth comes out that Yamato, the girl, does love Takio. Their feelings are mutual and they begin dating and the series from there is an exploration of their relationship through their high school years as well as the relationship between Takio and Sunakawa and their friendship. And that is basically the premise in a nutshell. Yeah, no, that, that short story, the like first two chapters basically of the manga are pretty much perfect, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> No big deal. Yeah, it's an amazing, I think it's an amazing pilot chapter. Uh, I mean, I believe that those two first two chapters were run together as a 100-page pilot when the series first debuted. And it is like a great self-contained story. It's very interesting because while the series does focus a lot on the relationship between Takio and Rinko, the first chapter, the central relationship that's focused on, is truly between Takio and Sunakawa. And it's really how about these characters are looking out for each other and how they care about the happiness of their friend and that's really the emotional climax of that first chapter is Takio is relating their friendship to the story of the blue ogre and red ogre and how the blue ogre sacrifices his own personal happiness for his friend the red ogre's happiness and Takio is like oh the blue the uh, red ogre the blue ogre is just too kind and it's such a sad story, but Sunikawa sees it differently. Sunikawa is like, well, of course you would do that. Who wouldn't want to see their best friend happy? And that is ultimately that climax of the chapter is like reflecting on why are we friends when we're so like from outwardly, we seem so totally different. Well, it's more than just the fact that we're childhood friends and neighbors. There's definitely a deeper connection between us. We are truly close in a special way. And I think that's, I think the friendship between Takio and Sunigawa is just as important as that, as the relationship between him and Rinko throughout the series. Oh, I mean, yeah, the true love story is between Sunakawa and Takio. Let's be real here. I, I, <laughs> like, I was, was going to say the same thing. <laughs> yeah, like, let's be very clear. That's the real my love story. <laughs> I think we see them kiss just as many times as Takio. <laughs> right? <and> that's, <laughs> that's true. Like, oh my goodness. <laughs> so I let's dive in now to how we first discovered the series or heard about the series. Would you like to go first, Ashley? Sure. I mean, again, as I mentioned, I actually watched the anime first. Uh, I guess it actually only came on my radar when the anime came out and people were like, it's so, it's subversive of shoujo. And I watched the anime and I was like, yeah, I get it. Like, it is subversive of shoujo, but I didn't feel that much watching the anime. I was kind of like, eh, whatever. Uh, and then I actually went and read High School Debut, Kawahara's other series, and based on just the anime of my love story versus that, I actually liked High School Debut better. Uh, there were things between that friendship that remind me a lot of my high school years that I was like, oh, I, I think this is really dope. And I think that that series is much more of a stereotypical shoujo, but like lightly subverts some things that I was like, oh, I'm, I dig this. Like, this is fine. Uh, yeah. And then I was like, no, but I should read the manga of my love story, obviously. <laughs> uh, I have a shoujo manga podcast. That's like a thing I should do. Uh, so you, you all finally made me read it. And I was like, oh no, this is much better as a manga. <laughs> the, the, the pacing that you can do as a reader is much better. Also, you know, the anime only gets through the first nine volumes. I guess it's nice to be like, oh, it's a completed story here. You only had three and a half more volumes to go, anime. What's up? Why didn't you just do it? <laughs> What's up? I don't understand anime sometimes. That's fine. Yeah, it's truly a shame they did not make another season to adapt the rest of the story. I know. It's so close. I just don't understand. Whatever. I mean, granted, I think, um, I don't think the manga had ended at the time, but I mean, I, you it know. didn't. But I mean, now, now I that mean, it's over, I mean, I, for another year, but yeah. I mean, now that yeah. you'd think that afterwards that they would put another season. I was going to say, yeah, now that it's over, I mean, I, I don't know if the anime just didn't do very well or if the, if it didn't do well enough to warrant another season. But I mean, I don't know. I would, I would at least like another like 12 episodes, maybe. Yeah, like I think it just needs another core, right? <laughs> I would think so. Yeah, that would be that would have been enough. But for whatever reason, Madhouse did not decide to pursue another season. 
But, I mean, that's what we have the manga for. With the manga, we can read through to the complete ending. And, like Ashley said, in many ways, the manga is a better experience. Yeah, I, I definitely think it's a better experience. I mean, it's like nothing about that animation or like, I don't remember any of the music. Like, don't come at me, people, if you really love the anime. Like, that's fine. But it's just like, <laughs> I was like, I don't, nothing was added by the anime to me. Things were only added by the manga. I will say things that I really like about the anime is I like the color palette. And also, I will disagree on the OST because I do think there are quite a few memorable tracks. Particularly the opening and ending themes are still ingrained in my mind, even though it's been four years since I've seen the anime. So, yeah, I, I feel there's some memorable tracks in there. Maybe my brain is just bad. I don't know. I don't remember anything. <laughs> Fun fact, I, I listen to the ending theme of, like, on loop a lot while reading the manga. So, because I just, I, I really like that mood? song. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I mean, there, there are good songs in there, I think. Okay, I should have augmented my manga reading experience with the <laughs> OST. I see. That, that could be a strategy. <laughs> I mean, if it helps, like, I I hate to say it, I actually don't really remember a lot of the actual, like, background music from the show at all, honestly. I'd, I'd have to watch the show again, but I don't know. I, I like the anime myself, but again, it's, it's still that thing where it's like, oh, I really wish it would complete the story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I know, shoujo right? anime in particular is like they never complete the story they're like i don't know we did like a third this one's good it got through most of it i guess you got an anime how much more do you want yeah how much more do you want <laughs> getting the anime is really the key here like that's, that's as far as we're going i'm like all right <laughs> maybe people will remember the series fondly enough that 10 years down the line they'll make a new my love story anime that does cover the whole story like with fruits basket yeah they're, they're gonna fruits basket this maybe <laughs> <laughs> but colton how do you get into the series mm, yeah my uh, my story is not that special i just I don't, it, it, my love story was just one of those things that like i had seen people talk about before it got licensed before it ever got an anime and I remember people going on about how subversive it is, and you know, just just from like the like I guess the volume covers alone had me really interested. <laughs> they are good because uh, I and I think I was talking a little bit about this on Twitter, where I don't agree with the way Viz I guess re-edited the uh, the covers for volumes one and two in particular because the the original Japanese covers have Takio pretty prominently, or at the very least, like you know. They have him placed in a way where it's like you could tell like he's the main character, whereas the Viz volumes kind of put uh, at least for volumes one and two they do place both uh, Sunakawa and Yamato both pretty prominently, and you just kind of have Takio in the background, which I think is kind of unfortunate. But uh, that's just me in particular. Um, but no, yeah, uh, it's just one of those things I kind of saw around, and I I want to I think because um, I remember Viz actually when um, when they still ran their weekly show and jump they I think they ran a preview of my love story in the Viz show and jump, and I remember reading that. That indeed they did. Um, and I also read the because uh, I know um, my love story did crossovers with Nisekoi at the time too. Uh, so I remember reading those and thought those were kind of cute. And I was like, okay, I, I got to read this sometime. Uh, but then I think like a year later or something, the anime got announced. And I was like, okay, cool. I'll watch this. And uh, I tried watching it week to week. And it was just one of those things where it's like, I forget to watch one week and I just never watch it again. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I did eventually get around to watching all of it. I basically marathoned like the rest of the second half of the anime. And from there, I was like, man, I really love the series. I need to get to reading it sometime. Uh, and then I guess like two years later, I, I I mean, I finally read the manga for this podcast. And, you know, like Lum mentioned earlier, yeah, I, I love this manga. Like, it's it's really good. <laughs> it is. It's really good. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And so to go over my history... I also started with the manga shortly after Wiz had licensed the series and I heard a lot of buzz about it. I think the idea that it is a subversive shoujo story is interesting to kind of dissect and so I think we should discuss that a little bit later. But that was also one of the selling points uh, when I first heard about it and heard it being discussed that made me curious to check it out. 
And I was in, uh, instantly smitten with just the characterization of Takio and the friendship between him and Tsunikawa and just how charmingly sweet the love story between Takio and Rinko was. And so I, after I caught up on the Viz release of what they had out at that time, which in the fall of 2014 probably was only about the first volume, maybe the first two volumes, I definitely did, because I still visited at the time, seek out the un unofficial translations and read through whatever was available of those. Which, when I was rereading the series... I definitely think it was it was actually quite a ways in and must have been because I also remember this from watching the anime that because I had, I knew the story for what was covered in a long portion of the anime until the very end, uh, definitely before the Ichinose stuff at the very end of the anime. So I must have read like the first set of what was equivalent to the first seven or eight volumes worth of the manga before the anime came out. And then afterwards, I didn't after the anime came out, I didn't revisit the manga, though I had kept up with purchases of the Viz release until it ended. But yeah, so this is my first time since 2015, I guess, that I revisited the, st the manga of my love story and read it through to the conclusion. Even though I've had like the, the last couple volumes sitting on my shelf for like two years at this point. That's since Viz finished it. But yeah, I mean, that's the story with a lot of the manga I got by. I got by them and they sit on my shelf for a while. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, I know that feeling. But yeah, like I do really love the series. And I, I think watching the anime for me was a great experience. Because I watched it with V-Lord pretty much beginning to end. And we both had a lot of fun with it. And it was fun watching with him because I knew the story, but he didn't. So I like seeing his reaction to things. And we even turned a lot of friends onto the series. A lot of male friends, even. Uh, we had a wee party, one of our infamous wee parties, uh, where oh, a group of us just got together and we binged through a bunch of my love story. <laughs> and it was a great time. Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, I, I sort of had the same experience, too, where it's like, you know, a, a lot of my friends and a lot of my, like, real close friends don't watch a lot of the same stuff I do. So my love story at the time was kind of one of the few things, one of the few new things that, like, when it came out that, like, a, a lot of my friends really got into and loved just as much as I did. So we even we kind of got to, you know, watch a bit of it together, you know, and, until, again, we all just kind of stopped following it weekly <laughs> for whatever reason. Um I also forgot to mention, um, and I feel remiss if I didn't, that uh, I think, uh, I mean, as ashamed as I am to kind of admit it, I think this is the first full shoujo manga I've read in its entirety. Now that is this quite is a sad. shame, Colton. <laughs> that's just sad. Oh my gosh. Uh, but see, that's interesting to me because it's subversive of shoujo, like, but you don't have the basis in what it's subverting. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> come on. <laughs> I knew you didn't read much shoujo, Colton, but come on. Come I think on. the only other shoujo manga I've read is, I've read most of Fushi Yugi, but I never got to finish it. Oh boy. <laughs> oh boy. All right. <laughs> well, that sure is a shoujo. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, tr I'm trying, guys. I'm, 2019 is going to be the year I fix that, so. <laughs> and that was the point of the poll. So you need to read uh, Banana Fish and Shiafaru and Yon of the Dawn this I'll year. I'll read all three. That you better do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I feel like I feel like I'm at the principal's office right now. Like I'm sorry, I'll do better. Yeah, <laughs> come on. You got an F in your shoujo manga knowledge. You need to raise those grades before you can graduate to manga expert. Group. I feel like I should be wearing a dunce cap right now. Like that's how I feel right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, I. I can't remember the exact timeline, but my love story anime definitely came out like a year or two before I started my podcast. And I think I had had a moment where I like watched a bunch of shoujo anime years and years ago. And then like I was falling behind. I like wasn't reading that sh much shoujo manga. And every day, like my partner at the time, uh, you know, listened to a lot of podcasts and manga podcasts. And he'd be like, there's a Gintama podcast and like all these general podcasts and <laughs> You know, there's the Shonen Jump podcast. And I was like, do none of these podcasts cover shoujo? Like, I am baffled right now. <laughs> it's just like, fine, I'll just make a shoujo manga podcast because apparently that's a real low bar <laughs> to cover. 
and like yeah I don't know <laughs> it's it's weird so I think my love story came at a time where I was like god why are there no nobody talks about the shoujo even though like it's great I don't understand <laughs> uh I'm 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 sorry I should have done a shoujo podcast instead <laughs> I know. <laughs> Everybody should do Expand shoujo your shoujo manga knowledge. I know. I guarantee you one of those Gintama podcasts were mine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I guess the One Piece podcast. Yeah, it's just like every individual shonen jump series gets its own podcast. And I was like, all right, slow your roll, everybody. <laughs> slow down. There, yeah, there needs to be more shoujo manga podcasts for sure. But I'm really glad that you started Shoujo Intel to fill that niche. And I've been enjoying like every episode that I listen to. Though there are some episodes I don't listen to because I haven't read the series. That's fine. That's how I want to do it. Because like honestly, I don't want to contribute to everybody feeling like they have to read everything. I'm like, no, 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 no. Just read the thing. Like listen to the episodes for things you've already read. Or what if you listen to the beginning and you're like, that sounds cool. Like stop listening. Go read it. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, usually I'll. Sometimes I'll listen to the first part of your discussions so I can learn like the the beginning of the series, but I, I I will avoid the second part until I finish reading the series so I don't get spoiled on how it ends. Yeah, because we will spoil everything. <laughs> <laughs> like we're gonna do here or two, right? We're gonna spoil all the things. I was I was gonna say we we kind of do the same thing, so you know. Awesome. Yeah, this is not a spoiler anxious podcast. There are spoilers abound. Good, good, good. <laughs> Because I need to talk about the ending. Because honestly, I think what turned me off initially from my love story was that I really didn't connect with Yamato. But then the ending of the manga, I was like, actually, I really feel those those feelings. I understand. I understand you, girl. Like, I feel you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, the series is from Takya's perspective most of the time. So I, a lot of the time, I feel like we only understand Yamato's feelings from his perspective and from like kind of that distance because Takio is the only character that we can get into his head and see what he's really thinking and then with other characters we only know how they're feeling through like what they say and even in scenes where Takio isn't present we will only learn what they think and what they are feeling through their conversations with other characters. So Yamato is also a character who puts up oftentimes the front of being cheerful and optimistic and hides like how she might really feel from Takio. This is like a conflict that happens like very early in the manga where Takio tells her that don't worry I won't do anything to you until we're much older and she's like oh okay and she <laughs> has a hard time like getting courage to tell him that no actually I do want to be intimate with you I do want to like hold hands with you and that's like a big challenge for her like she does suppress her feelings all the time uh, and then throughout the series though we do see like hints that she has a lot of self-doubts in her own right much like Takio she was someone who thought that there wouldn't be anyone who she she thought that she wasn't very attractive she didn't think that anyone would really fall in love with her so they're not too dissimilar in their mindset and that's really interesting to see kind of those parallels and, and, and think about them as the series progresses. Yeah, to me, it was just like, I don't know, I guess because we see it from Takio's perspective, I was like, Yamato doesn't have much of a personality to me. Yeah, like she just is like, I bake things and I'm happy all the time. I'm like, that's weird. So then when we get to see her be depressed at the end, I was like, yes, this is this is the darkness I needed <laughs> for you to have right now. Like... <laughs> But like I went through a similar thing with my partner. We had been going out since high school and then we were going to go to separate colleges. So we were sad. And I was like, thank you. You have you do have feelings. And like she just becomes a mess. And I was like, yes, that's, that's, <laughs> that's what I needed. That's what I needed. <laughs> You're a real person to me now. And it really is interesting that once she's separated from Tokyo, she loses so much of that confidence when she's in Spain. And that really is throwing like a curveball in like her life because her grades are slipping and she feels alienated because she doesn't she can't speak Spanish very well and communicate with other people. And so she really feels isolated and alone. And it is like a really relatable kind of feeling and like a low point for her to, that you can empathize with because that idea of like alienation from other people like she doesn't even have like a sunakawa in her life that you know she can rely on just to confide feelings in 
Yeah, I, that Takio realizing that when I was like, thank you, Takio. You, you do understand. You're getting more perceptive here, Takio. What's up? <laughs> but I guess we should go back to talking about Takio, the actual main boy of the story. <laughs> yeah. So I, I guess one of the elements that people considered subversive about my love story was that the protagonist was someone like Takio. I feel like that people look at the cover or look at character character design at first glance and go like, oh, it's about a unattractive protagonist who finds love. But I don't that for one thing, that is definitely not the intent of Kawahara and Aruko themselves. Like they designed Takio as kind of like a handsome and cool guy that they found attractive. Like the series was apparently, um, t- apparently it debuted in Basatsu Margaret with the tagline, ugly guys are in, which Kawahara herself found very rude because that's definitely not the point of the story. The point of the story is that a lot of people are attracted to Takio and see admirable qualities of him and love him a lot. And it's Takio himself who thinks that he's not worthy of love, who thinks that you know, he is just someone who is never going to find love because of the way he looks and because he's comparing himself to Sunakawa all the time and seeing, like, Sunakawa as a better person than him and more deserving of it. But then, like, by the end of the first chapter, he realizes, no, there is someone who loves him. And then, throughout the series, he realizes it's not just Yamato. Like, he insists to Yamato during the Maria arc that, oh, don't worry. You don't have to worry about anyone else falling in love with me. I'm not popular. But then, like, when Maria confesses to him, that's, like, opens his mind. That's, oh, no, that's not true. There are a lot of people who love me and, like, look out for me. And it's also a great moment because that also makes him realize that he doesn't just love Yamato because she's the only one who loves him. She loves He loves Yamato because she's the only one that he, he really thinks about in that way. Like that he truly loves. So it's not that she's the only girl who loves him is what drags him to her. It's that he, she is the only girl for him and like his mind. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was a really profound moment too, just on that aspect. But yeah, so I I think that element of it, that Takio is this unattractive protagonist and that is the subversive element is like missing the point of my love story. And I also, I'm not sure if the series is necessarily subversive when people describe this series as subversive like do you guys feel like there is an element to that that it is twisting on uh, shoujo tropes in like a way that is meant to critique or go against them in in like a necessarily intentional way I mean, as we have discussed earlier, I, I I've only read one shoujo manga, so I I can't really um, speak to that. But and just as someone who ha- who doesn't have a lot of experience in shoujo manga, what I, I guess what I found kind of surprising was, uh, you know, like in the very beginning, I totally just kind of you know, I because obviously we don't know Sunakawa very well uh, in the very beginning of the manga, so. You know, I think it's easy for people who are just starting the series to assume, like, you know, he's totally stealing all these girls from Takio, uh, whether it be intentional or not. Um, I, I, I'm i sure some people might have just assumed it was intentional, but kind of having that reveal that, like, oh, Sunakawa is actually, like, the best bro anyone could ever have um, and actually, you know, loves his friend and cares about you know, all these girls who are bad-mouthing him, like, I I personally found that uh, somewhat surprising, because I think, I think it would have been easy to have Sunakawa kind of be, a secret, be, secretly be the asshole who, like, you know, steals all these girls from his friend, but no, he just, he just genuinely cares about his friend. And, and, and again, whether that's like a shoujo thing or not, I can't speak to, but personally, I, I thought it was pretty refreshing that he's just a good friend, so. Yeah, I think what is subversive about this manga there are things that I think are subversive, and there are other things that I think tried to be maybe subversive and failed at being, or maybe they were trying to play it straight, and because we have all this talk about it being subversive, you like read it wrong in the beginning, and then you're like, oh wait, it didn't go that way that I thought it would. But I think like male friendship is not a thing that I can think throughout many shoujo series happens, like the portrayal of a healthy male friendship. It's always like, 
oh, they're love rivals and then they become friends or like they're only friends via, you know, the girls that they are dating, they're friends. So they all become friends, right? Like, yeah, <laughs> I, I, think, I think that I think that's the thing, too, is like, you know, personally, I, I can't romance isn't really my preferred genre as far as like just stories go, because like a, a lot of the romance stories I, I have read personally always include like the these situations where it's like why don't you just talk to them you know right. like like <laughs> like there are so many situations where it's like that where where characters can end up in where it's like you know if you just talk these things out like we we wouldn't have to go through all this extra stuff and i i think that's kind of the i i i think that's the thing i kind of like about my love story is that it doesn't hinge on it doesn't hinge on these wild misunderstandings for like for like drama or whatever like it's a very personal story about people who actually like you know if they can't talk out their feelings they learn to and i think that's the thing that makes this series so relatable to me in particular and i'm sure for a lot of people right this is a very affirming manga like they are actually constantly telling each other i do love you it's not like random situations where they're like oh no now i don't know how this person feels about me and like what could possibly and like i mean there are situations like that where it's like okay a a love rival has appeared but it happens for like to maybe like a volume max <laughs> they're a little bit confused it's about not, what, it's not how they actually yeah. feel yeah it's not a prolonged like multi-arc like there are things in this i've, I've just read kimi ni Toke. that's a 30 volume series it's much more of a stereotypical shoujo series it's very it you know lingers up- upon like very basic things and there's just an arc in there where it's like eight volumes of a really dumb misunderstanding that in this, in my love story, is just like a chapter. Oh, <laughs> and I was see, like, Thank that, you. yeah, that sounds like my personal <laughs> hell. I don't know if I could go through that. Yeah, it's admittedly the worst arc of that, but like, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Uh, so there's a lot of like looking at those two st- series. They're also basically contemporaries. Obviously, my or Kimi Chodke has gone on longer, so it was prolonged more. But like, it only just ended, so they were running at the same time, basically. So I think that the male friendship is the most subversive thing. The thing that annoys me that I thought was going to be more subversive was like the purity politics of Yamado because I thought it was really cool that she is like Takeo is the one who is all virginal and <laughs> upstanding <laughs> and like that that exploration of masculinity and like good masculinity and stuff um was great. And then I thought it was great that Yamato was like no, I'm the one who's like you think I'm super innocent. But I'm super, super like into you and thirsty for you and all these things. And I was like, that's awesome. But then like anytime that comes up, because it happens at least two or three times, it's like one kiss is enough to like satisfy all of that sexual tension. And I'm like, I don't know. I don't buy that. I don't buy that at all. And I don't I don't appreciate this like still really virginal aspect of <laughs> this shoujo manga where I, re- I really wanted it to go harder into that aspect because I feel like it was set up like really early on that that was a plot point for her and I was just like come on <laughs> come on it's definitely a very PG depiction of uh, sexuality <laughs> right? between Takio and Yamato and I was like really excited for it not to be but it totally was and I was like no I'm so disappointed <laughs> I, I feel like it would have been kind of jarring to go because I I I don't know, like, I, I see where you're coming from, but I feel like it would have been really jarring to go from this, like, really PG, sweet, charming love story to just hardcore, uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm sure it probably, it probably would have happened off screen, but I don't know, I, I'm not sure if there's, like, an easy, I'm not, I, I don't know, I, I'm sitting here kind of thinking, well, how, how else could this have been handled, and I'm, and I'm just having a hard time coming up with a solution. Well, I think how it could have been handled is that they decide, okay, we want to be physically intimate. We want to have sex. Like, are we ready to have this? Like, have conversations about that, you know, like they have been about their feelings throughout the entire series. Yeah, like they just don't have open conversations about it. And anytime they do, then it just kind of like resets. Like they don't hold hands properly ever, apparently. That's adorable that they mess up holding hands just because they're so awkward and being and like nervous 
being around each other because they love each other so much. I don't know. I was like, get it together, y'all. Or like, <laughs> they never kiss consistently. Takeo has the thing where he's like, I'm going to call her Rinko. And he like, never does. That never happens. He does it like once. And I was just like, come on. keep Just keep one of them consistent, at least. <laughs> it was basically my my takeaway. I don't know. I, I mostly saw it as like baby steps. Like, I, I feel like I kind of understand that thing where it's like, you know, I, I really want to do this, but... I don't know. Uh, I I guess I kind of disagree in that, you know, Rome wasn't built in the day. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I do think it's weird that after the entire arc towards the end, where Takio is abstaining from touching Yamato because he's getting so worked up around her, and then Yamato is like intentionally engineering situations that would get her close to Takio so that he would like touch her and notice her and stuff and get excited because she is very happy that he's doing it like that and then eventually they have a conversation that you know it's okay for you to have these feelings around me I have the same feelings for you I do think it is weird that at the conclusion of that arc like they share a big sloppy kiss (laughs) but that's as far as it goes right because they already had done that before they need to make out that's what I'm saying (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they need to kiss at least more cons- they need to kiss each other goodbye like something give me anything really here yeah <laughs> um but yeah no that's actually the parallel arc that's crap in kimi Todake too is that it's like uh the dude is like oh my god i can't control myself around her so i'm not gonna touch her and that gives her like super anxiety for again like six to eight volumes some ridiculous amount of volumes like seriously And then finally, it's actually their teacher who's like, oh, wow, you haven't touched her for like six months. What a cool dude you are, JK. That like you're super, that's super uncool. And it's just like, yes, the shoujo mangas get it. They're just really bad at like (laughs) releasing that tension, getting over it and talking about it. And then just being like, here is how we're going to remedy it in a, you know, actionable way. (laughs) God. But at the same time, I don't think it is necessarily wrong that they wouldn't want to progress their relationship much further than kissing, necessarily. No, like that, if they that want could to be fine. To do it, that's fine. But I think that yeah. they should have had more of a conversation about it. Like the series does tiptoe its way around even mentioning sex by name. I don't think they explicitly mention sex by name at any point during the manga. Oh, yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> The one time Takeo was like, Yamato is being such a tease. And I was like, whoa, we use the word tease. What's up? That's That's scandalous. That's as raunchy as it gets. I was getting hot in here. Other other times the series will just use euphemisms for any feeling to sexual desire. Like saying Takeo is getting excited. And not saying like he's getting turned on. Sunakawa was like, I can't say desires. That seems wrong. (laughs) Stop making me talk about this. Stop it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> poor Sunakawa poor poor boy <laughs> but I guess to turn the light on that on Takio how Takio expresses like how he's feeling to Sunakawa and like trying to share like how he's feeling towards Sunakawa like it is kind of admirable and going back to the male friendship idea to see such a close friendship where these two characters can be open about their feelings with one another and can talk about like these kind of subjects to each other at least without embarrassment on Takio's part. <laughs> well, because Takio's always like, Suno, what if I practice kissing on you? And Suno's like, please don't. <laughs> please, that's a step too far. We've gone Wraps way the too plastic far. plastic wrap around his head. <laughs> yeah. Some pushing daisies nonsense is happening here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so rare to, like, have a friendship like that be portrayed between two male characters just in any manga, I feel, that... Like, they are, would be so open and frank emotionally, and it doesn't, like, take a lot of build-up to even get to that point. They're, f- like, that way from the start. hmm Yeah, I do wonder if it's still a little too, like, baity on them being possibly lovers, like, instead of it just being a bromance, like, a, you know, them being great friends. It's like, they do see the sexual tension between them <laughs> a little too much, maybe. I'm like, mm, all right, but that's fine. But no, Sunakawa is the, is the best character. I'm just going to throw that out there. <laughs> uh, and I think that he in particular is the best character. This also is maybe, I, I don't know that I would call it subversive, but I think that he's a great portrayal of what introverts are actually like and a thing that you don't see a lot in manga. Because I feel like when manga normally tries to portray somebody who's like shy 
or introverted. Those are two different things. Uh, but like, they'll be like, oh, it's because they're an otaku who's like kind of eccentric in their personal life and they just like haven't found their little niche yet. And then they discover, I don't know, like Princess Jellyfish or whatever, that sort of deal. But Sunakawa is like, no, I just like to read books. And like, <laughs> he's not eccentric about reading books. The one chapter, the one bonus chapter where we get to see him be excited about a book, I was like, that feels so real right now. Like, his hype level is actually pretty minimal. And then he's just like passive aggressively mad that Takio has ruined his book. And I was like, that's, that's so real. And Sunakawa is like drained when Tanaka, Tanaka's the transfer student or whatever. Yeah, when Tanaka comes and tries to be his friend because he's like, Sunakawa's the hot one or whatever. I want to look cool with Sunakawa. Sunakawa like lays down in Takio's room and then is just like, I just need to go to bed <laughs> because <laughs> he's like so drained by having to hang out with somebody new and stuff. And I was like, this is awesome. Or And then the other bonus chapter where they're talking about like embarrassing things where they tried to imitate somebody else or whatever. And Sunakawa like went to get a hand grip to try to be manly like Takeo and build muscles and all these things and he was like what am I doing this is weird and embarrassed I don't I'm I can't be like Takeo and he just like immediately discards it I'm like yes that is definitely <laughs> it's like he thinks that's super embarrassing because as an introvert you think every little dumb thing is so like scary even when people don't know about it and then you're just like no Sunakawa that's like adorable and nobody cares <laughs> <laughs> he just wants to be like his friend he does. <laughs> yeah. I, I really appreciate Sumikawa's characterization because unlike yeah, like you mentioned, like unlike other introverts, it's not that he's like he's not so he's not it's not like he can't function in society. It's not like he he's feels alienated from society and like out of place in it. It's just that he is a quiet person, he just likes keeping to himself. Uh, he just isn't sociable and that he's just not inclined to be that way. And that's okay because he only really needs his friendship with Takio. Like that's as much social interaction he really wants and that's good enough for him. Yeah, like he has his sister, he has Takio, and then through Takio, you know, they hang out with other people sometimes and he seems totally fine with that. And he's like, this is great. Like this is all I need and I want to read books. And like... Actually, the most adorable scene with him was when he decides to watch Takeo's little sister while the mom goes to the grocery store, and he's, like, talking to Maki. Like, this is such a thing. It's like, I'm talking to another human, but, like, they don't understand me, and that's fine. <laughs> so he's, like, talking. He's like, I feel a little lonely because, you know, Takeo's hanging out with Yamato more, and, like, I don't know, I need some social interaction, I guess, or whatever. And Takeo overhears that and is like, Suna why don't you tell me more things? And Suna's like, oh my god, I am so embarrassed. Please, no, this is terrible. I need to run away now. Like, the most terrified introvert. He's like, I've done, I've done a bad. This is too much for me. Talking about feelings. It was great. I love Suna. He's the best. It, yeah, it's really adorable. I know. So, like, he's just... I was like, thank you, Manga, for not making him eccentric or, like, shy. So the difference between introvert and shy is, like, shy, you actually get social anxiety, like, talking to people. Introvert is just, it's, like, it's kind of exhausting, but you can do it. And he's just, like, a perfect introvert. <laughs> yeah, it's basically the contrast between him and a mommy. A mommy is someone who's definitely shy and has trouble, like, talking to people, like, e finding even the words to say. Mm -hmm. yeah. which is like why she has a hard time like communicating with Sunakawa for a long time and just watched him from afar for like 10 years right yeah, yeah totally <laughs> <laughs> oh boy <laughs> not creepy at all no <laughs> no <laughs> but I mean definitely yes <laughs> she grows from that like when we see her later on she seems to have made friends with Takio and Yato and seems to have become like more socially able. Yes, I'm proud of her. Good job, mommy. <laughs> <laughs> I I personally want to give a shout out to uh, to Takio's mom because she's probably one of the best moms in manga. Quite honestly. Yeah. I don't know. I just I I just love how like I, I love how like even when she was pregnant, you know, uh, Takio and his dad. Which by the way, his dad is handsome as fuck. Um, <laughs> I. I, I I love it how like they constantly worry about her, but she like it's 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 like she's not even pregnant. 
like she she might as well just not be carrying a baby because she she could still do she could still still do pretty much everything like a mom and a housewife can she still like cleans the house you know goes out to buy groceries and whatnot she's even helping other pregnant women <laughs> um yeah she, she's pretty much a superhero in my eyes like like she's she's great i love her basically yeah it's great to see her do it but also like you understand that she is taking steps to like protect her baby like when she's cleaning you see her like being in the weird positions like oh this is the the way that it won't hurt my baby this is the way to clean now like you know sort of deal i'm like yes and she is worried after she saves the other pregnant woman from falling down the stairs that you know that might have had an uh, adverse effect on her baby and that causes her some anxiety that's very noticeable uh, for the rest of like that story arc yeah she's also just so real when she was like like this is a manga inherently about not taking things for granted uh and takio is very touched when his mom is like you know some children don't get to grow up and like live full lives so like don't take life for granted basically like she has this no-nonsense but still very cheerful attitude that really clearly affects him and he tries to live with. And I was like, yes, that's nice. And that's why it's so nice to see the protagonists always be so affirming of their love for each other. Like, he's always like, I love you, Yamato. And she's like, I love you too. And then he's like, Suna, like, we're bros. <laughs> and Suna's like, what's up? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sakio is the best and all these things. And I'm like, thank you. It's so nice that you just say those things out loud instead of wondering about it forever. <laughs> It's interesting because, like, for a while while I was reading, like, it, it sort of felt like, uh, as far as, like, the story goes, like, at first I felt it was, like, very light, um, and I I, I, I kind of thought about the possibility of people getting into this and, uh, and, and maybe not feeling like there's a lot going on, like, it's just, it's just cute for the sake of being cute, but then, obviously, later on, you kind of realize, you know, sort of the point of my love story is that, you know, it's basically just Takio just learning to be able to express his feelings and, you know, learning along the way that he does deserve to find love and and whatnot. Um, but, I mean, with that being said, like, honestly, like, Takio is such a great character that I, I could just I could just read about him forever. Yeah. <laughs> Sequel manga of him being an adult. <laughs> what his adventures are. I mean, honestly, I, I would I would read that day one, like. Same. Yeah, I would love that. I mean, Kawahara and Aruko wrote and drew him to be their idea of what a cool guy is. And, I mean, he does consistently amazing and awesome things. I mean, like, from very early on, when he's, like, when he rescues two people from a burning building and he jumps out of the burning building. I mean, that is pretty badass. I remember me and Velor joking that, oh my gosh, they should they should air this on Tanami <laughs> and in the trailer just use just that, that scene to sell, to sell it as an action show. <laughs> oh, I, I don't want to admit... Um, I said this on Twitter, but I really don't want to admit like how loudly I sobbed when I first watched that episode. It was it's pretty embarrassing, <laughs> actually. <laughs> yeah, well, see, that's another scene I think where it's like it's lightly poking fun at more stereotypical romance tropes because he's like, I could die here, and that would be great to like sacrifice my life. But then he realizes, you know, it's better to live your life entirely with the person you love. That's more of a, a cool thing to do, probably. <laughs> um, show how much you you love them and everything. And uh, yeah, I don't know. So like, there's lots of ways in which I think this manga gently pokes fun at other shoujo tropes with like those action scenes and everything and Takio's masculinity in particular. Like I love the scene where Oda is basically forcing himself on Ai, Sinakawa's sister. They're doing the Kabedon thing. Uh, so he like pushes her up against the wall and she's like, what are you doing? And he's like, I pushed you up against the wall. Did you fall for me? And she's like, no. <laughs> and then like Oda kisses her and Takio sees that that upsets Ai and is like, you should not have done that. And they're all immediately like, yeah, that was a bad thing. And I'm like, yes, that's that. Those are the things that are like refreshing about this manga. But I still hesitate to call them subversive so much as like isn't that how everything should go <laughs> like isn't that just how the masculinity should be <laughs> yeah this is like a healthy 
a portrayal of what masculinity should be and then like also how you should treat other people yeah <laughs> I, was, I was gonna say i you know th th that's the one trope i'm i'm very familiar with so when i when i got to that <laughs> point there you, go. you appreciated it <laughs> when i got to that point i was like ah there it is took him long enough <laughs> That moment's is definitely a surprising moment for Takio because Takio always wields his strength responsibly and uses it to protect other people, help other people. It rarely do we see him fight people and like punch or hurt people. But in that moment, you could definitely tell that he was tr so truly angered by what Oda has done because that is, I think, the only time he throws a punch at someone to like hurt them and stop them. Like outside of participating in like the judo competition or whatever well i guess it's seeded from he gets suspended for punching the groper that uh was harassing oh, yeah, Yamato that in the also happened but he got that was also a moment where he got very mad on the because of how someone because of how that person was mistreating someone else no totally and that's great yeah I, I feel like starting with a groper is also like kind of a typical shoujo manga thing <laughs> like groper on a train is here so it's like in the same way I think Kawahara just knows she's like I've I've read the shoujo's like I know throughout all our series she has these light gentle uh breaking of the stereotypical tropes that you've seen. Yeah, I still just don't know if it's enough to be like it's the most subversive thing ever. <laughs> like <laughs> I definitely don't think that should be the selling point of my life story that it is good because it is subversive. I think that right? what readers should be attracted to my love story is is because the central issues are so compelling and also because the series explores the emotions and feelings of its characters and depicts communication between the characters and how they're feeling uh, in a very healthy and uh, responsible way in a way that other romance series often don't do. And especially its depiction of masculinity and positive masculinity is something to be noted as very rare among other titles, shoujo or shonen, where oftentimes there is going to be like a domineering aspect in the male characters when they try to, like they often might try to coerce or uh, force uh, of female characters or other characters into acquiescing to what they want. But in my love story, Takio is always, he always is a supportive person and he never like forces Yamato to do anything she doesn't want to do. And the relationship is mutually amiable. I mean, yeah, like I, I think that's just a problem with um, like going back to the whole subversive thing. Like, I feel like that's kind of a problem with like, just people who are into media in general like people are so obsessed with like uh, subversions and how does this deconstruct this trope or this genre or whatever like that's i don't know i i see a lot of people put a lot of stock in that kind of thing and while i think like those kinds of conversations are interesting um you know like again as someone who doesn't have a lot of experience in shoujo manga like i feel like i got a lot out of this series even even though I'm I'm not familiar with shoujo tropes, like I I feel like I got a lot out of the characters. I it, it took me a while to kind of realize what Takio's sort of character arc is, but once I once I was kind of clued in, like I was kind of all there. Like I I really like seeing Takio just kind of you know learn to express his feelings and learn that like basically that he has worth. Um, I thought that was a very compelling arc that I thought really wrapped up nicely with his sort of monologue at the very end of the series that, that, you know, that his love story can is, you know, is basically the same as anyone else's love story, which I thought was very beautiful. Most definitely. Yeah. I just love that. It still does the shoujo thing of like, you know, you're sold of on this, like the back cover is like, Takeo is not, is a giant person with a giant heart, but nobody loves him. And it's like, Oh, everybody falls for his best friend all the time. And it's like, yeah, that's that's the one shot. And then like the rest of the series is not at all <laughs> like about that at all. It's kind of just like, oh, now nobody we don't care about anybody being in love with Sunakawa. It doesn't matter. It's like nobody even is in love with Sunakawa aside from Amami. And that's like addressed in a volume. So like, who cares anymore? Uh, and it just goes off to be something else. We see girls swoon over Sunakawa, but it's never the focus of the series. The yeah. focus is always on. Takio and Rinko's relationship. 
And Takio and Sunakawa's relationship. I was I was kind of almost waiting for an arc where it's like, oh, uh, is Sunakawa finally gonna fall for a girl? But I also I'm also okay with him just, you know, like we said earlier, like I, I'm I'm okay with just him, you know, doing as much socializing socializing as he wants to, and and not much else outside of that. Like that's just him. Yeah, not everyone needs to couple up and get into like a romantic relationship. For Sunakawa, his friendship with Takio is enough for him. And I think that is perfectly fine. <laughs> he's so good. <laughs> I, I love when he hits snapping points too. Like when he's like, when he just tells Tanaka, I don't like you and walks away. I'm like, yes, that's perfect. <laughs> that is such a, an important character moment because that's like the first time he like vocally expresses his dislike for someone. Like all that time he was like passively just hanging around Tanaka because he's, he, isn't just blunt enough to say, no, I don't want to be around you. And even though he's visibly annoyed because Tanaka is bad-mouthing his best friend and stuff, you know, he just doesn't take the initiative to just not hang around him because he views it as, like, more of an effort to ignore him. But then and ultimately just gets to that point where he's like, no, you know what? I don't like you. I don't want to be around you. I'm not going to be your friend. And, uh, yeah, it's just a great character moment for Sunikawa. Oh. Yes. Yeah. Anytime Sunakawa got like visibly upset, I just it, it honestly kind of scared me a little bit. Like <laughs> <laughs> because it is so rare for him, because he's such a mellow person who keeps to himself, which again makes the moment where he slaps Takio before like having self doubts about his relationship with Yamato and breaking up with her and fulfilling like the promise he had to Takio that if like he ever veered off the wrong path like slap him to his senses but like yeah i mean just like him actually being upset with takio like in a serious way like that is just so rare and astounding that it leaves a huge impact mm -hmm. in that moment Soon and i definitely for takio that moment is definitely the big wake-up call he has to realize yeah i messed up and i need to make this right yeah, you did, Takio. What are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing, bro? Come on. <laughs> I also want to just kind of give a shout out to the to the little arc with um, Kurihara and uh, Nanako. Um, I thought that was a really sweet little arc where uh, I, I, I the moment that really stuck out to me from that was where, you know, because obviously, you know, Yamato and Takio really want to be supportive of their friends and try to get them together. But then they're kind of faced with the reality that at the end of the day that not every relationship can work out as well as theirs and you can't force that kind of thing on people like you kind of have to let that thing sort of build naturally which i i thought was it was interesting for me because it's like my love story is really cool because like you know obviously uh, yamato and takio like they have their issues and their pro their foibles that they kind of have to get over but like it's this weird mix of like, yeah, it's an idealized relationship that not everyone has, but it's also still very grounded at the same time, which I don't know how it achieves this mix, but I think it achieves it very well. Mm -hmm. No, it totally does. Yeah. I know that, Lum, you wanted to talk about how this is actually a manga that's one of the other big differences between this and other shoujo manga is that this manga is not about the chase of the girl or like getting in the relationship oh yeah it thank is about you being being in the relationship right like <laughs> yeah i was i was gonna say that earlier like um but I, I wasn't sure if this was a thing in shoujo manga but i know it's i know it's a thing like it, just in anime and manga in general like a thing the thing that well, in any ro romance story, really, yeah. like so yeah. many stories are about characters coupling up and getting together, and that's the climax of the story. But here, that's just the beginning, and the rest of the story is them working through their feelings and their problems being in a relationship. And that is oh, so much more rare for the entirety of a series to be about that. And I think that's... I think that's a more interesting angle to take too, because it's like, yeah, sure, we can we can watch all these hijinks where it's like, how do I get the girl? Oh, I got to do this thing or this crazy wacky sitcommy sort of scheme. But like at the end of the day, yeah, I I think it's more interesting that you know Yamato and Takeo got together like very early on. To, like I think it's more interesting to in stories to see people kind of work together and work through their issues together more so than them actually trying to like 
trying to get together. Like I'm, that was something I really appreciated as well. And even in other stories where there is a lot of focus on characters in a relationship already, or like explores those ideas, it usually does not happen from the very start. Like with Yamadakum and the Seven Witches, it's like 90 chapters until the characters become a couple. And then, you know, the remaining 150 chapters are them being in their relationship. But like, again, that's still 10, 12 volumes until you get to that point. Ah, uh. <laughs> yeah, I would say it's the same with Kimi Choke. Like Kimi Choke, 30 volumes. The first 10 are them getting in the relationship, having all the miscommunications and whatnot. And then the last 20 are them in the relationship, but it's still like, you know. My soul was going to leave my body if you said it was going to take 30 volumes for them to get together. <laughs> no, it's not that crazy. It's not that crazy. Just, just 10 volumes crazy. Just 10 no. volumes. <laughs> 10 volumes, yes. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, this is good because it's like all those other things make it seem like the hardest bit is getting in the relationship where actually in real life, I feel like that's not, if particularly in these times where we have like dating apps and all this nonsense. And like when you're in high school, you, you are around so many people all the time. Like it's way easier to make friends in a school setting than it is in like a work setting, basically. Yeah. All these things. So it's like, it, it, you know, all these manga make it seem like the getting in the relationship is the hard part. And I'm like, no, that should be pretty easy. Like getting in the relationship is you ask, they say yes or no. Cool. <laughs> like whatever. Uh, it's the staying in the relationship and the relationship that you presumably wanted so badly all that time that is like really, really hard. It takes a lot of work to stay. It's not like magic. Like I got in the relationship. Now it's permanent forever. Woohoo. Yay. We're no. going to be happy forever. Yeah, exactly. It's like, no, it, it takes a lot of work to live together for whatever your lifespans. <laughs> if that's what your tr goal is here, which presumably it is. <laughs> it's like, uh. yeah. So it, it's nice also to see them acknowledge that they are young and that it's like a little bit ridiculous. And I mean, it still ends with a marriage proposal which is like mildly annoying but <laughs> like yeah you're only 17 maybe wait until you're fully uh, self-sufficient adults before you take that leap yeah yeah yeah. just like chillax for a second but you know well, i mean to be fair takio is even like no we'll, we'll wait we'll wait till we're older yeah but again you're proposing while you're still in high school <laughs> yeah see how your life goes like <laughs> living apart and going to college and picking careers those are big things like big stuff <laughs> you don't know which like how it's gonna go or anything but yeah man i mean just kind of going off of that i was really hoping for like some kind of time skip or something before the end like i really wanted to see, i want to see the cast of my love story like aged up at some point maybe like an epilogue chapter or something down the line i would love to see something like that my love story of the college years. <laughs> oh boy. Uh, that's an interesting wish because I feel like most of the time in shoujo manga, when I get to the end, I'm like, I didn't need this epilogue. I didn't want this. I didn't. Nope. <laughs> didn't, didn't want. <laughs> Take it out. <laughs> Delete it. <laughs> but I guess, was there, was there anything else you guys wanted to touch upon? I think that the series also challenges ideas that you need to be self-sacrificing to the detriment of yourself in a good way. Because both Takio and Sunakawa are willing to sacrifice like their own happiness and keep like their unhappiness to themselves in order for their friends to be happy. And the series, you know, goes out of the way their, its way to have them confront each other and be like, no, you don't need to be unhappy for my sake. You know, let's work through this. These feelings to come to a compromise. Uh, so I think that's a very good message. Uh, and I, yeah, again, like, the central thesis is that you should believe yourself to be worthy of love. And that even if your feelings might not be returned by some person, that doesn't mean that there isn't someone out there for you. Which is something that a lot of characters, you know, learn throughout the series. Not just Takeo himself, but like even characters like Saijo and Amami kind of learn these uh, ideas too. And... I, I really like the Tanaka arc uh, because of how I think it addresses this idea of like having parasocial relationship or like just a relationship with social media in place of actual friendships and how damaging that is. 
Because Anaka is someone who's like obsessed with popularity and popularity online and on social media to the fact that he's not even living in the moment. Like he's going to these popular spots and pretending that he has friends and pretending that he's popular, you know, in order to accrue online popularity in place of actually having friendships. And then Takio and Sunakawa end up reaching out to him and like help him realize that he should be living in the moment and actually reaching out and forming genuine connections with people rather than basing connections with people just through being popular or being in the popular clique on social media and in real life. So I thought that was a really good message uh, and really good exploration of those ideas that's, you know, increasingly relevant as social media becomes such a overwhelming force in a lot of people's lives and especially with like a new generation of kids growing up and like online all the time yeah i really I, the, the moment that really stuck out to me in that arc in particular was when uh tanaka takio and sunakawa are, are out camping and spending time together and whatnot and tanaka sees a, a cliff with a bunch of flowers and he you know he's trying to take a picture and he can't get a good view so takio offers to literally climb him up the mountain <laughs> or whatever um and you know while tanaka's tied to takio is trying to take pictures but you know while while he's dangling from a cliff and takio literally has to be like hey like put your phone away like this is really dangerous like i just i don't know like i it's it's just one of those moments where it's like like it seems ridiculous but like i could totally see somebody in this day and age actually doing something like that and it just makes me kind of sad <laughs> <laughs> it's a good message to see the world through your own eyes and not through the lens of your phone's camera. Yeah, I, I totally feel the same way. Yeah, well, what I like the most about Sunakawa and Takia's approach with Tanaka, even though I think, like, overall the Tanaka arc felt a little random to me because he just, like, appears and, like, takes Sunakawa, and I was like, this doesn't feel real to me. For, like, that a transfer student just comes and is like, I request the presence of Sunakawa. And Sunakawa's like, okay. <laughs> like, I'm like, what? I don't, this isn't how life works. I don't understand. Um, but sure. Like, his message overall in the end was fine. So I was like, great. Uh, but what I mostly like about it is that also, like, Sunakawa and Takeo are like, you know what? He says he wants these things. So, like, we're going to give him those things and see that's how we're going to tell if he's a good person or not, if he, like, actually appreciates after what we've done for him and all these things. Um, but also, I think that generally Takeo and Sunakawa, to all people, are great because they, they're empathetic enough to reach out to people who are not within their social circle, right, to, like, help them. They're always helping strangers and all these things. But they are also kind enough to each other and appreciate each other enough to constantly be protecting the people in their circles so they're like you know tanaka we will like hate you if you are mean to sunakawa or whatever and sunakawa is always like i reject girls because they talk bad about you takeo behind my back and like you are you're my bro so <laughs> can't have that like that you are more important to me than anything um and yeah just the genuine appreciation of like again you know it's good to make friends and social media can facilitate knowing lots of people but also like having a core group of people that you can re depend on is like way more important and fulfilling normally than having a kajillion followers on twitter or whatever <laughs> <laughs> yeah the twitter followers won't come save you and climb a cliff with you <laughs> no 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 <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, that is such an admirable thing about Takeo, Takeo in particular, that he is just so willing to help people in need and not think twice about it. Yeah, no, that's like him thinking twice about it is like, oh, no, that's not good, Takeo. Don't <laughs> don't think about it. Just just go for it. <laughs> Though Takeo does learn that Takeo is very much a person who lives in the moment. Uh, and we see that throughout the series that he doesn't do he does things without thinking all the times but of course he does learn by the end of the series that not only it's not just enough to live in the moment and be satisfied with how things are but also he needs to actively like fight for his future which is basically the crux of that final arc where he has to like 
go out of his way to preserve his relationship with Yamato, not just by excelling in his studies, but also after he makes that huge mistakes and thinks that he is hurting her by being in a relationship with her and realizing that was a mistake to break up with her, to go all the way out into Spain and like rebuild that relationship. Oh, gee, my, my heart sank. Like, <laughs> that was, that was, that hurt a lot. Yeah, but man, what a great moment it is that all the characters that they've interacted with throughout the series and helped along the way convene together to yell at Takio and to tell him, no, you've made a mistake. You need to get back together with her. Yeah, I, th- I thought that was a really, I thought that was a pretty interesting moment because you even have people like Ichinose and Tanaka, like, you know, like was he, did was Ichinose not doing anything important? Like, and also didn't Tanaka like transfer to another school? Like, <laughs> they took time out of their day yeah. and traveled from afar. They were like, to this is the most together. important thing. This is the most important <laughs> thing. <laughs> Documents. I love the panel that's just showing like all the characters like marching towards Takio's house. It's so good. And people are wondering like where are they all going? <laughs> yeah. What's up with these people? I thought that was a very uh a very interesting moment for sure. Cause it's like for some of those people, it's like, how far did they have to travel just for this one person? <laughs> no distance can keep them apart, man. <laughs> What's up? Ain't no mountain high enough. Yeah, ain't no mountain that's high enough. That's true friendship. Yeah, I do love how many times like people going to an airport and then like, I don't know, they go to Okinawa spontaneously, they go to Spain spontaneously, uh, I chases down Oda in the airport that one time, like, all right, y'all like to run away like a lot. That's that's, <laughs> that's cool. a big common trope in romance stories, like the, ch- the chase to the airport to stop someone from leaving and fest their feelings for them before it's too late. The series really likes to use that. Oh, man. Yeah, like, I can't help but think, like, if I were in that situation and someone were chasing after me, you know, even if they were like, no, wait, come back, I love you, I'd be like, I, I mean, okay, I'll stay, but, like, can, can you pay me back for my airport ticket? Like, yeah. <laughs> flying is expensive. <laughs> like, I, 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 wouldn't, would, I wouldn't just want to, dr- I mean, I wouldn't want to just drop my flight, like, I already bought the ticket. But it is kind of amazing that this is such a common cliche in so many romance stories. Off the top of my head, this ha- I I remember this happens in Nizikoi, this happens in Kimagure or in Drone. This is a trope since, uh, I guess, since airports have been a thing. Since airports been a trope have existed. <laughs> Our whole lives. <laughs> Always a trope. <laughs> I just feel like airports, you used to actually be able to more easily do stuff like that. But now I'm like, yeah, no, airports. Yeah, how are you going to guess through security? Exactly. I'm like, you got to do security <laughs> and everything now. That doesn't make sense. This doesn't make sense. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Maybe Japanese airports like, are more People lenient. would question Rinko and Takio. I mean, I guess if Takio is supposed to look like an adult, maybe not. But they'd be like, they'd have to have IDs and like, they would show that they're minors. And like, I don't know. All these things would like get in the way. <laughs> I just want a scene with one of them like trying to go through trying to go through like security in the metal detector and the security guard just being like, "Hey, what are you doing here? You gotta get in line with everybody else." I'm in love. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it just annoys me because I'm 29 and I swear, like a year ago, I went to the airport and like I was by myself, being 28 or whatever, and the security <laughs> guard was like, "Uh, who are you with?" And I was like. I am 28. <laughs> just like, he was like, oh my god, whoa, my bad. <laughs> like, I thought you were a minor. I'm like, you thought I was like sub 18? Like, I'm so confused right now. <laughs> what so, the heck? I know. So, like, airport oh. stories like that is just like, I'm just like, no, the airports don't look work like that. It's just not, <laughs> they just don't. Yeah, yeah, the TSA doesn't give a shit about your shitty romance or whatever. You I gotta know, follow yeah. the rules like everyone else. Yeah, I know. God. The TSA would stop. Tokyo for like an extra check. Yeah, probably yeah, totally. just because of how big he is, and that they'd be suspicious of him. I know. God, where's my manga that shows me realistic airports? <laughs> <laughs> that uh, that should be parodied in, in like a romance manga at some point. Just this idea of oh, I have to race to the airport to stop this person, but oh, I have to get, I get a ticket because they <laughs> yeah, won't let me in without one. Like, oh, yeah, exactly. I have to go through security. Oh no, I'm detained. <laughs> <laughs> I know, yeah, like, <laughs> Oh no, they think I'm, I'm an illegal immigrant. They're going to deport me. No, like, oh my god. What? Oh no, I, I oh wait, I, I forgot to leave my hand soap at home. Now they think I'm a terrorist. Yeah, now they think I'm a terrorist. Oh, no. God, 
that's what I need. That's what I need. Get it together, manga. <laughs> Get it together. <laughs> a- any any series that includes that is automatically like contender for best manga of all time in my book. Like seriously. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. My goodness. I feel like the only other thing I wanted to touch on was the art, actually, because I think it's really great. I also think that it is heavily inspired. I haven't read that much like older shoujo because I'm a I'm not that great at this, but like it fe- the, especially in like Yamato's eyes and stuff, it feels very heavily inspired by older like sh- 70s shoujo with like heavy heavy use of blatant sparkles and all these things. I'm like, yeah, I dig it. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I could see that, especially with Takio. He he doesn't look like your modern like you know protagonist at all. Like he 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 feels like somebody that would a he feels like a character from a seventies manga. Yeah. Oh, especially his dad. His dad actually feels super like he's from a seventies manga to me. <laughs> yeah. Like Takio looks like Gogol thirteen is his dad. Like <laughs> honestly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Or, or, or at least as, like, his grandfather or something. Yeah. I don't know. There's just a lot of instances, too, where, like, Yamato is not drawn quite chibi, but, like, a soft, like, rounder, older style looking sort of deal. And I'm like, I, I dig it. I'm, I'm down. I'm game. <laughs> I, I, I could see that. And to me, it's really interesting how Aruko's arc differs from Kawahara's arc, and especially in the way in how each of those artists draw, like, the main characters, because Kawahara's Takio has a much slimmer face, is not quite as bulky. He definitely looks like a different character, almost, because his lips are much smaller, and his eyes are much bigger, with different type of eyebrows, and this changes throughout the series, when we have, like, Kawahara, like, drawing Takio in different ways throughout the series during like the author's comments parts but yeah I always feel that her Yamato in particular always looks so different from Aruko's Yamato because there's just a quality both in like the eyes and her face that just look a lot more sharper like uh Kawahara's character designs look a lot more sharper with more like blunt shapes as opposed to the rounder shapes of Aruko's so Yamato in particular looks almost like a completely different character to me. It's like with Aruko's Yamato, I definitely get that sense that she is a very cheery, innocent girl. But with uh, Kawahara's Yamato, I get kind of a mischievous energy from her. So it's really interesting just how like the nuances of how they draw the characters. Like there's so much different characterization that you can draw and interpret for them, which is, I think, why Kawahara is always so awestruck with how Aruko draws the characters. Because there's definitely an energy that she notices, and I definitely agree with, that Aruko captures with these designs that Kawahara's designs definitely can't. That, like, contributes to this idea that these characters are, like, really innocent and optimistic and cheerful. In a way that, like, uh, uh, Kalharis doesn't. Yeah, uh, really the only character out of the three that I feel like is the most similarly designed, no matter who draws him as Sunakawa. Which is interesting because Kalhar is always complaining about how she thinks her Sunakawa isn't cool enough. That's always the character she's dissatisfied with how she draws. I mean, I actually agree with her. When I look at him, I'm like, yeah, you drew him less hot and you made Takio hotter. <laughs> it's like, yeah, exactly I mean, that is true. That is true. Even yeah, though I, can see that. I do still agree that when I compare her Takio and Ruko's Takio and I her Sunikawa and Ruko's Sunikawa, I think the Sunikawa's look much closer than the Takio's do. Yeah, but she's definitely just being like, Sunikawa, you're not, I can't, you're not, you shouldn't be as hot. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I I, I guess I could see there being a different energy uh, comparing the two designs, but, which is, again, which is interesting because to me, both designs really do look very similar. It's just interesting. Um, Also, Takio is, does not look the same at the end of the manga as he does in the beginning. Like, he really, uh, I think, got the most dramatic change throughout the series. Which is pretty expected with a manga that runs for any considerable length of time that as the artist becomes more comfortable drawing the characters, they eventually will get more simplified and smoother uh, because the artist is more comfortable drawing them now and has a better, has a like clear sense of like how they approach the character. 
I, I also just love uh, how expressive he is, too. Uh, Takio has way too many good faces. Yeah, yeah. Aruko really has fun playing with Takio's face to create some really great wild takes. I, she's so playful in her art in a really fun way. Like, Takio's shirts, when he's wearing a white t-shirt, always has fun text that represents know, what yeah. he's thinking on them. <laughs> I was like, where do I get this? <laughs> Where's this shirt <laughs> sold at? magic t-shirt that has the what he's thinking on it all the time. Like, when he thinks Yamato's had a bad day at work, it, like, reads, come at me. But that's your major mark at anything. It's just really wonderful quirks like that that I really love about her art. And it's really quite incredible that apparently Kawahara's storyboards are very simple. Like, the just basic idea of where characters are placed and dialogue. And then Ruko takes all that and really comes up with the visual element of it all on her own. Which is quite impressive to me. Like, apparently... My for minor characters, Kawahara would just write, oh, a, a simple description of what the character looks like, and then Aruko com- came up with a design all on her own, which is quite impressive to me. And this, is, I mean, the main three themselves were kind of designed that way. Like, Kawahara asked Aruko to draw her, like, a cool-looking guy, and so she drew uh, Sinakawa, and then she asked her to draw a kind of character type that doesn't normally appear in shoujo manga, and that's how she drew Takio. And so, yeah, I mean, Aruko's really good at coming up with, like, very interesting character designs, like, consistently throughout the series. Yeah, I, I, I thought as far as the art went and, like, the paneling and sequencing, I thought were all pretty good. Um, Aruko's art is, like, it feels very minimalistic in places, but I think it also gets the job done. Yeah, it's, it's all about, like, the where she places are the focus of the reader, like... There is a lot of panels that are just focused on characters' faces or even just text balloons, but it's paced out in such a way that the flow of reading is always engaging. And so you don't need to have like a whole lot of art going on sometimes because you're already like engrossed in what you're reading. And then because the art can be so minimalist at times, when there is like a big profound dark moment a big two-page spread that even has even more impact her art doesn't feel super cluttered which i it, like it's, it's very easy to tell like what's going on yeah i prefer less over more certainly <laughs> i i have read my over cluttered shoujo and i'm always like what's going on here that's that's fine feelings i don't know people have feelings it's fine <laughs> definitely less is more sometimes when it comes to like telling uh, to drawing a really good comic because if you have too much visual elements going on it can distract the reader on what they need to focus on but i always felt the focus was very clear in my love story which i think is one of the reasons why it's such a engaging read in a way that it is better than the anime in that the focus is so clear and that the pace that the reader can go on is so controlled and p- deliberate in a way that like leaves them satisfied with every chapter. Yeah, I mean, they talked before about like feelings, minds, hearts, or whatever the line was, being invisible and but being the most important things. And I'm like, this manga knows when to use like most spreads between Yamato and Takeo. I feel when they have a big dramatic moment, are just the two of them like looking at each other with text dialogue and i'm like yeah it knows what's up it knows what it's doing (laughs) it knows that it is depicting the feelings and the minds and the souls or whatever via just having them in a space where nothing else exists and it's only the two of them looking at each other feeling each other out (laughs) yeah yeah uh are we gonna have our manga fight (laughs) oh yeah well i mean before we get into that there are a few i think we've uh lauded the series on many levels for a lot of things Uh, i do want to mention a few minor criticisms i might i might have of it and they're really only a small amount uh one while i this the characters themselves are very chaste there were times, particularly towards the beginning of the series, where I was worried that Takio might be sexualized a little bit 
in odd ways. Uh, mainly the when Takio is working at like the bro, uh, masculine like bro bar, yeah, uh, <laughs> the, the club, and he's wearing these really tight shirts, the shorts, and like the and, and the, booty, the booty shorts, yeah, yeah booty the shorts. Booty. <laughs> and to me, and so you know, it's funny, but also Takio is a high schooler, and he seems like he's being hit on by adults, and to me, that made me a little worried. So I I think that. Was a little was a little questionable, even though ultimately it was har- pretty harmless and innocent. Yeah. And then uh, I get the there's a, my only other red flag I had while reading the series was the character of Ichinose. For he's probably the character I I like pretty much all the characters in my love story, but Ichinose is probably the one that I really have problems with and really dislike. Because for one thing, Ichinose's personality is pretty terrible. Like he's this egocentric, self-absorbed, rude asshole who's like really thinks so highly of himself and like puts down other people. And to the, like his entire staff really doesn't like him because he kind of con- is so condescending towards them. And he like tells Rinko that oh, you the way you say welcome is weird. And don't embarrass our shop. We have a reputation to hold. Like, he really puts her down for no reason at all. So that's bad enough. But also, he wants to date Rinko. And he's a 21-year-old dude who wants to (laughs) date a high schooler seven years younger than him. And I'm like, this age gap is no stranger to, like, manga and stuff. But, like, this, no. I, I don't like, like, him even being... Uh, presented as a potential love rival or someone who could win over Yamato's affections. And I think it's very uncomfortable, like the situation he places Yamato in and that he has these ulterior motives and he pretty much forces her to spend time with him instead of Takio to help him bake this cake for the competition. So he's very manipulative in that way. And also, again, He's very judgmental of Takio. He's just a pretty bad person all around. And ultimately, he does come around to Takio and, like, have great respect for him. And he's a funny character in some other ways. But just, like, there's so many aspects to his character that I just really didn't like. So I was pretty disappointed with the anime version that that's where the anime ended. But And I'm glad there's more story after the manga. Though, at the same time... The Ichinose arc is like the second longest arc in the series besides the final arc because it's five chapters long and basically is two volumes. Uh, It's like at the end of volume eight and goes through the beginning of volume ten. So it's it's one of the longer stories, which is a little unfortunate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, that, I mean the core message of it in Tokyo, like having to deal with a rival for Yamato's affections, and then you know learning to have trust in and know how Yamato feels for him, and like having that self af- having that self affirmation. You know that that's that's good stuff. The Tokyo end of it is good. Character of Ichinose, not so good. Uh, I do like his get his quirk of like how his tech how his inner thoughts are expressed to these big bold text yeah. uh, that appears on panels and like that it, expressing what he really thinks and like it's just his inner thoughts so no one else can you know understand what he's really thinking except for Takio who apparently can read and understand what he's thinking which I think is pretty hilarious because they both love Yamato I don't know <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah no Ichinose was also annoying to me. I mean, admittedly, all the side characters felt like a little weak to me. I don't know. Because the core three are so strong and just no nobody else can reach that hype level for me in this this manga. I kind of agree for the most part, I think. Yeah. The series really is about the core three. Though I do like a lot of the side characters when they show up in the story. There are a few that, you know, I would have liked to see more of. I would have liked, like, uh... Talk to follow up to us to the Saijo arc where Takio does help Saijo, you know, with getting together with another person. Like the end of that arc kind of alludes to, like Takio promises, you know, if you never need my help and oh, yeah. fall in love again, I'll be there for you. You know, I would have liked to see that. I would have liked to see maybe more of a mommy kind of grow into uh, someone who was like more socially capable and had more of a social circle. Uh, I kind of wish that. 
I, Yamato had like her own Sunakawa in a way, like a really close friend. Because her friend circle, like she has a lot of friends, but I don't feel like she's really close with any of them in the same way that Takuya is with Sunakawa. Yeah, and that's why I guess things fall apart for her in Spain too. Is like I don't know, is she talking to those people? I, I guess I don't know. <laughs> um, I think just in terms of the side characters, like I, I think are probably the most interesting to me are one Takio's mom, and then two. I, I think I thought I was a pretty interesting character. Yeah, and I is the only character who has like more arcs than just one. Like she has like follow-up arcs to her story and that's pretty interesting because like the last of those fellow arcs are just between the focus of that story is just the relationship between her and oda and it doesn't necessarily tie into the takio yamato relationship or takio sunakawa relationship which is like the only story i think that doesn't tie into that in some way and see that's interesting because i i do agree that ichinose I I think is really annoying, but uh, it's, for some reason I I thought I don't know I just I didn't I didn't really like Oda that much I kind of yeah I kind of <laughs> thought he was obnoxious. A knee neater. Oda is also a manipulative person and uh, a person who is like interjecting himself into the situation. You know, trying to kind of control and force i to do stuff she doesn't want to do so i don't really like her and also again he does force himself on i which is a really shitty thing uh-huh. and then he manipulates her again into thinking that he's gonna leave forever when he's just going to india for like a week so i was like i you can do better you know i don't really appreciate oda's character either uh yeah and i didn't like the implication that you know, i did ultimately fall for oda after, like, she slapped him at the airport and stuff, but she came back home with, like, kind of that, sm- ha- like, content smile on her face. So I didn't I didn't necessarily think that they should got together, because I, I don't think Oda's a very good person. Like, 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 I get it, you know, she has to get over Takio at some point, and I understand that, but it's but it's also like, yeah, you, you could do a lot better. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, Oda is, like, my second least favorite character after Ichinose, for sure. Even though, again, like Ichinose, he does have funny moments, but, like, what he does in the series is pretty questionable and unlikable. Yeah, I would say, actually, the one of the red flags for me was I, I appreciate what this was trying to do, but it was the police cafe that the girls have at their school, and I'm like... I appreciate that you're not making a maid cafe, <laughs> I guess, <laughs> uh, because they go to an all-girls school and all these things. At the same time, I was like, mm, but the weird like sexual implications of this in an environment where you all are knowingly like, oh my god, the boys come and like harass us. I was just kind of like, why? I don't. I didn't need this <sighs> chapter. Like, I didn't need this. This whatever. <laughs> Did think it was just an excuse to dress Takio up in a policeman's out <laughs> yeah and i was like nah i w- i was fine without that um <laughs> <laughs> so there are a few minor quibbles i think we all have with the series i i think overall they don't detract from the core enjoyment of it and what makes it so good but yeah yeah not, it, it, still there are some imperfect elements to it i was gonna say there's way more good here than there is bad yeah oh totally yeah and again, I really appreciate a lot of the small jokes in the series. Uh, like, uh, from the like, even at the beginning, like the gr- the Groper shirt on it is the number sixty nine. So, oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> like, they, wow. I love the way they sprinkle in those little visual gags like that. So, of course, it is. <laughs> but yeah, I feel like we pretty much covered all the bases we wanted to talk about with my love story except for one crucial central question we put it out on twitter for our listeners to send us some my love story related questions and topics and stuff and we only got one from our good friend allison who asked the question that is on every my love story fans' mind who is the true best boy, Suna or Takio? And since we only have this one fan question, 
I think we should do something a little more interesting than just simply answering the question. I think we should have a manga I'll, I'll, I'll be sure to put in the manga fight music here to accompany that. <laughs> yep. We're going to have a one round manga fight. Rules are, of course, normal manga fight rules. Uh, opening argument, one minute. Streak, how to arguments, uh, one minute each. Closing argument, one minute. So basically, every person has five minutes, and we alternate off one minute each for every for, for you both of you guys. I I think we should I think we should make the time thirty seconds. Yeah, we can do thirty seconds. Sure. Yeah, because I I feel like it might be I think it might be hard for the both of us to keep our uh to keep our arguments at at, at a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds fair to me. So I think the first question is before we even go into this manga fight is. Which one of you is going to argue for Suna, and which one of you is going to argue for Takio? I'll argue for Takio. Yes, I want to argue for Suna. <laughs> all right, all right. So, let's answer the question. Who is true best boy, Takio or Suna? And who wants to go first? Actually, to make it more interesting, I am going to pick a cover of my love story. Okay. So, I am going to tell you... What is on this cover? And you will have to tell me what volume number it is. Oh, no. Okay. Okay. Are you guys ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Mm Mm-hmm. All right. So on this cover, Tokyo is dressed up like a prince about to kiss Yamato, who is dressed up like a princess. Volume 11. Nine. Colton is right. It is the cover of Volume 11. Which one was Volume 9 again? Volume 9 was Takio dressed up in a karate uniform. Oh, There's yeah. fire in the background. It looks all badass. And he's totally not Ryu from Street Fighter. Oh, no, no. They, they look this similar completely. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Should, wait, should we just mention what our favorite volume covers for My Love Story are very quickly? Because we alluded to it before, but like this series has great covers. Yeah, um, I, I, I like a few of them, just to mention them real quickly. Uh, I, I love the, I think it's volume five, where like he's in a tuxedo with uh, with the roses. And uh, I especially love the one, I think it's volume 12, where... Uh, Cowboy? Where, yeah, it, it, it looks yeah. like a... Yeah. I'm I'm sure like it, it looks like a it looks like a poster for like a really old Western movie. Like I, I love that cover uh the most, I think. Yeah, that's my favorite too. What about you, Ashley? I think volume eight where he's dancing is kind of my favorite. <laughs> Takeo's dancing. That one's so good too. <laughs> Just really appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, a lot a lot of like the back half of the series as far as the covers go are probably like my favorites. Yeah. I also really like volume seven's cover, which is like them and the like, Takio is in, like, a kabuki kind of costume and makeup on, and looks, like, very, like, uke as Japanese art, almost. Yeah, that one's pretty good, too. Okay, now, time for the manga fight. And Colton, since you guessed the cover right, you will go first, with your opening argument about why Takio is best boy. And you will begin in five, four, three, two, one, go! <laughs> All right, so Takio is best boy for a lot of reasons, and I I could spend the next thirty seconds listing them all off, and I think I will. Uh, one, <laughs> he has great faces. Uh, I think he's very expressive, and I mean, I mean, how, how can you say no to a good face game? Uh, and you know, just to list a few other reasons, he's he's always helpful of others. Uh, he always puts others before himself. Uh, uh. Actually, uh, I mean, if I had to say so, I think he's personally more handsome than Sunakawa. I mean, I don't know if that's a hot Ooh. take, but uh, <laughs> um, and yeah, time, okay. Ashley. There we go. Your opening argument. 
Okay, Suna is the best friend you will ever have and that you need in your life, first of all. Uh, he is very emotionally supportive. Perhaps he cannot beat up things like Takio can, <laughs> but he, uh, he's going he's gonna to look out for you in all the emotional ways that I think Takio is a little too dense to uh, pick up on a lot of the time. Uh, I will admit that this is hard because I actually think that Takio and Suna work like are perfect for each other like they need each other to make each other stronger but you know i'm just gonna throw that out there <laughs> um, be nice right here um, all right time yeah. colton car into argument um i i do agree that takio is dense uh this is very true um but uh takio you know i i think we see that throughout the series you know he he obviously uh, he he tries to make up for that by trying to be aware of other people's feelings and just aware of his surroundings in general. And that, uh, you know, if he makes a mistake, he will more than likely make up for it. Um, and just in general, like, Sunakao- Time! Ashley, counter-argument. Okay, so Takio only learns those things because he has observed Sunakawa doing them for him. <laughs> uh... And Sunakawa is definitely way more attractive, first of all. Um, <laughs> conventionally attractive. <laughs> and um, yeah, just Suna is also like anything that Takeo is learning is kind of from Suna, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> like, I don't know. It's just like Suna has been his boy and Suna has taught him how to be like a kind person to use his masculinity in like these ways. And like his mom has done that too, but like. I really think observing Suna has done a lot for whatever Takeo is learning. Uh, All right, time. Ta Colton, counter argument. It, feel, it feels like Ashley's getting more time than me, but I'll let that slide. Um, <laughs> I'm on time.gov, uh, going through 30 seconds. So I'm letting both of, well, if both of you are in the middle of a sentence, I'm letting you finish that sentence until you're done. That's fair. Uh, but anyway, on to my time. Uh, so... I, I do agree that Takio does learn a lot from Sunakawa, uh, but I also think that uh, the opposite is very much true, in which uh, Sunakawa, uh, Sunakawa also learns from Takio, too, in that, you know, he sort of learns to kind of be more expressive about his feelings as well and to just to be more open with Takio um, and whatnot. Um, and so I think, like I said, uh, the opposite is true. Uh, it, it the, the shoes on the underfoot, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Like it's it's also true of Sunakawa that he also learns from Takio. All right, time, Ashley, counter argument. Okay, but Sunakawa only learns how to deal with Takeo. I think Takeo learns lessons from Sunakawa that apply to everybody, whereas Sunakawa is like, uh, maybe you just shouldn't trust me as much, Takeo. Like I'm not a perfect person, but he actually kind of maybe is a perfect person, <laughs> like <laughs> with like. <laughs> Like, with normal human failings of, like, you know, he has snapping points, that's fine, but, like, I don't know, he's not gonna get, he doesn't get suspended from school like Takeo, he, you know, he, he knows how to keep it together, uh, <laughs> and he, and because he thinks more, he's able to be like, hey, Takeo, you didn't need to go break into the school to get a printout for me, what's up, you, uh, we have these All things right, called All right, time, Ashley, I mean, Colton, contra argument. Uh, well, see, the thing with Takeo is that, um... You know, yeah, he 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 does he does kind of think in the moment, and you know, sometimes it, it does get in trouble. But uh, that's also a quality that uh, I don't think is necessarily a bad thing. Like, you know, uh, sure, it sometimes it gets him in the trouble, but it also keeps him it, it keeps him from overthinking about the situation too much. You know, he, Takio is a man of action, and I I think a, a lot of people would agree that that is a very admirable quality. All right, time. Ashley, counter-argument. A man of action is an admirable quality, but I feel like it is one that we see much more in manga generally. Like, all our shonen heroes are kind of meatheads who jump into stuff <laughs> and, like, <laughs> swing some swords around and are like, I'm protecting people, blah, 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 blah. Uh, so in that way, he doesn't, he doesn't feel special to me in the way that Suna's, like, quiet honesty not using fists, but using, like, like any time that people are like, thank you, Suna, for helping me. He's like, I didn't do it. Takeo did it. Like, he he's just brutally honest. And I think his his more thoughtful way, like, it doesn't prevent him from ever, from ever doing anything. He's just very thoughtful and more perceptive initially than Takeo is, so. Time. Colton, closing argument. Uh, my closing argument is that, sure, uh, 
you know, Takio may learn a lot from Sunakawa, but I also think that, if, you know, every once in a while, Sunakawa can also learn a few things from Takio as well. So, uh, also, I still think Takio is pretty handsome. That That's my closing argument. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Now, Ashley, your closing argument. Listen, Takeo's got sweet, sweet abs, but Suna's got that sweet, sweet hair. <laughs> sweet, sweet, <laughs> sweet, sweet, slender, slender body. Uh, will, his eyes will suck into your soul. Also, he likes to read books. Who doesn't like a good bookish man, my friends? Um, yeah, and again, he is the best friend that you need. He's always there for you because he's probably just reading a book and he wants you to bother him. So, like, do that. Uh, and he just wants to look out for you and, like... He's fine. He doesn't even need you to be on his hype level about the books that he's reading. He's just like, what's up? We can go climb a mountain. All right. Time. Okay. So that is the manga fight. Now, this was a really good back and forth, you guys. I felt that you both brought compelling arguments to the table. I think that when it came to distinguishing, like, what admiral qualities each of these characters have or like what how each character's relationship to each other worked and like how what lessons they teach each other to me the argument that stands out is that ashley argued that while takio gives sunakawa advice about how to talk to takio uh, sunakawa gives takio advice of how to uh pr- interact with other pe- more a lot of different people and also deal with a lot of different situations and so to me, that stood out as an argument, as well as the argument that Takio is a more uh, traditional protagonist in terms of some of the qualities that we see in him to other protagonists of other manga, especially in shonen manga, where Sunakawa is a more unique character in terms of like a character we don't often see depicted in the manga, alongside just other good arguments about like what makes him such a supportive best friend and uh someone to rely on and stuff like that so there is going to be a straw poll in the description of this episode for you the listeners to decide who is the true best boy and we will reveal the results when we record our next podcast but in my opinion as the manga fights arbiter as the judge I will say that the winner of this round is Ashley! I'm okay. Yes, Suna. Correct opinions right here. Suna is now officially crowned the best boy. I'm so I'm so sorry, Takio. <laughs> yeah, you should feel bad. You let Takio down here. Uh, rub, rub it in, Ashley. <laughs> <laughs> it's alright. Takio is like, it's fine. I love Suna. Suna's best boy. He agrees. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He'd be like, you know, I, I wanted him to win anyway. It's fine. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> exactly. Oh. I will say, in terms of the attractive points for each character, between abs and the hair, I'm definitely on Colton's side with the abs. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, abs are good. I will not lie. <laughs> can I can I get extra points for not totally bailing out of this walk of fight like I usually do? <laughs> well. That's the bare minimum <laughs> that, it, that it takes to participate in manga fight to actually do it. <laughs> can, can I get can I get a participation ribbon? Participation <laughs> sure. reward right here, yeah. Sure, you didn't give up. That's that's definitely progress. Yay! To becoming a, I win a something. Yay! <laughs> uh, oh, t- millennials. <laughs> <laughs> uh, totally earned. Um. But anyway, yeah, uh, this was this was definitely a discussion. <laughs> mm-hmm. We did it. <laughs> I'm glad we were finally able to talk about my love story after all this time. And I think we had a great conversation about what makes it so special. Yeah, and I guess before we kind of head on out into the ending of the show, uh, we'll, we'll definitely leave links in the show notes. But, uh, you know, if you're interested in my reading my love story, uh, go support the, the official release. Uh, you know, if you go to Viz's uh, website, uh, specifically their page for my love story, I'm sure you will find uh, tons of links in which where you can buy it physically or even buy it digitally. Like, it's it's pretty readily available. So, you know, if you have any interest in reading my love story after listening to this, uh, go read it. 
Yeah, uh, it's also available on my library. I had multiple copies of every volume, so check out the library. And I also really want to push Viz's digital releases because they are actually, in the way that people are like, why is the digital one always like the same price as the physical one? And I'm like, okay, well, that's because there's reasons for that. I won't go into them. But like Viz's actually aren't. Viz actually prices them at like $6. You could buy this whole series like real cheap. Mm -hmm. Go do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, m m most of Viz's releases are like what, like I want to say almost half the price of their um, of their dig of their physical releases, it's roughly I, I would say. But they they are still pretty cheap, like they're pretty affordable. Yeah, and I guess like you're saving the environment, less paper. Like, do it, go for it. <laughs> I mean, un unless you love my love story so much that you want to own it, you know, physical is not a bad option. So yeah, I mean, you do you. I mean, I either way, you're supporting the series, which is always a good thing, so. Yeah. <laughs> there are multiple price levels to love this series, and you should do them instead of stealing scans. It's basically my only real thing here. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll, we'll leave links for where you can buy love, My Love Story in the show notes for the episode. But uh, yeah, I guess, I guess that's about it. Um, thanks for coming on, Ashley. This was really fun. Yeah, thanks for having me. I, I'm glad you read a shoujo manga. <laughs> <laughs> I, I promise I'll read more. We're, again, 2019, the year Colton reads more shoujo manga. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. The, 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 year where, the year where I become less shonen trash by by the month. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, Ashley, uh, do you want to talk about like where the good people who listening uh, can find you and about shoujo and tell and whatnot? Oh, yeah. Um, so I am AshMcD00 on Twitter. I don't know why you would want to follow me. My podcast is Shoujo and Tell on Twitter. And basically, yeah, it's a podcast only talking about shoujo manga. I do eventually plan to maybe there's also Jose manga. Uh, maybe make shonen ex exceptions sometimes for like Nisekoi and uh, the more romantic ones, <laughs> basically. Um, and it's basically going through, like, we discussed the series today. Uh, each episode is normally about a different series, although longer ones get broken up into shorter episodes. Also because I don't want to read 30 volumes at a time uh, for, like, <laughs> an episode that's a little much. Kimi ni Torke, I'm looking at you. Uh, yeah. And so it's been around for about a year. We've done probably, like, 15 series, and it's an ongoing thing. Wow. And it'll be great. We're going to keep going through all the shoujos. <laughs> That'll take like 15 years. Don't don't quote me on that, but that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh that's the gosh. goal. Uh, ho hopefully we'll catch up to you at some point one day. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. So that was our discussion of my love story. And uh, we really want to thank Ashley for coming on the show. Uh, we definitely enjoyed talking with her about the series and we'll definitely have to have her on, back on the show for uh for more shoujo series to come yes uh, we really love talking with ashley and i think we definitely have a lot of opportunities this year to have her back on the show and i hope we can yeah so uh you know if we haven't said it already you know definitely go follow ashley on twitter as well as listen to uh, Shoujo and Tell. Um, I actually listened to some of the uh, Princess Jellyfish episodes of the of the podcast uh, after putting up the uh, Princess Jellyfish episode of our podcast, and uh, I really enjoyed the show. I, I, I just thought it was a really interesting podcast. Uh, so yeah, uh, Shoujo and Tell definitely gets uh, gets my recommendation if you're looking for uh, you know a, a good podcast about just shoujo manga in general. So. Yeah, two thumbs up. I'm glad that you checked out it after I mentioned it as my community shout out last week. But uh, I, I think we'll just kind of wrap up from there. Uh, this episode's already getting kind of long. Uh, so, um, yeah, I guess, Lum, where can the good people find you? You can find me at Lumriyasha on Twitter and as Lumriyasha on a variety of places, including Amateur Revelation and Annie List. And you can read my reviews on manga and movies on all-coming.com. All right. And as for me, you can find me on Twitter. I'm Colton. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at SniperKing323. I also host a few other podcasts such as Life Lessons, the Gintama Manga Cast over at GintalifeLessons.wordpress.com. And as well as One Podcast Prevails at OnePodcastPrevails.com. It's a show I record with my friend Doctor over at the Aspect Anime Podcast. 
about Detective Conan, case closed, whatever people want to call it. So definitely go check those out. And as for the podcast and all comic, uh, you can find every episode of Manga Mavericks at all-comic.com. It's where we post every episode first. You can also follow us on facebook.com slash all.comic or on twitter.com slash allcomic underscore. Uh, but if you want to follow Manga Mavericks specifically, you want to follow Manga Mavericks on Twitter at manga underscore Mavericks, as well as manga mavericks.tumblr.com for all the latest updates on the podcast. Subscribe to our YouTube channel as well over at youtube.com slash manga mavericks, uh, where we post different excerpts of the podcast, such as news and different reviews and whatnot, uh, and even some, some exclusive content every once in a while. Uh, but if you want to email us anything, uh, what do you think about my love story and whatnot? Uh, what are some shoujo manga that you want us to read on the podcast? You know, send us, send us your recommendations, whatever you're reading, your thoughts on manga, the podcast in general, over at mangamavericks at gmail.com, and we will read them on the show. Uh, but the most important thing, guys, is that you subscribe, rate, and review us on Apple Podcast or iTunes, whatever we call it. That really helps the visibility of our show. Uh, so please go do that if you so wish or if you have the time and uh, I think that is going to do it for the show this has been episode 78 of the podcast and we will see you guys next time for episode 79 bye guys sayonara